Hello, my name is Robert Vandermont, and thank you for watching Berean Endeavor. We need to complete this amazing picture of the sovereign hand of God in outlining the lineage of the rod of an almond tree, the tree of life. Let's be like the Bereans. Let's study. This photo is the apex of how this tree of life was used for humanity's salvation. It's the cover of the picture on the book, The Rod of an Almond Tree and God's Master Plan, written by Peter and Christy Micus. Peter Micus was the one that drew this picture, this image. And what we want to accomplish in this program is to give you an overview of the journey of the tree of life as it went from Genesis 2 to Revelation chapter 22. So I want to show you this aerial shot of Jerusalem. We have the Garden of Eden. We keep referencing that. We go back to it all over and over again because it's so important. And we talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the previous program. And then we began this lineage of the tree of life. And I plan to finish that in this program. So remember the original purpose or calling of the tree of life. If man would eat of its fruit, that person could live forever. And as I told you in the previous program of Brian Endeavor, I'm going to put scriptures on the screen as well as outside resource material to support the conclusion that I'm going to show you at the end of the program. I probably won't read all of them because of the time constraints, but I'm going to assume that some of you are going to want to get a copy of this and study the material. And if I put it on the, on the screen, you can freeze frame where you want, you can read the material where you prefer to do so. Also, word about these outside resources. The outside resources are used that are being used are meant to enhance, not supplant the Word of God. The intention is to help clarify what the Scripture is giving to us in God's Word. The Word of God is the standard for truth. Outside resources are useful in gaining a better understanding of what the Word of God is teaching us, but if they contradict what the Word has to say, then the outside resource is incorrect. So, with that understanding, Let's continue. And this is where we left off in the last program. We set up this flow chart, this tree of life flow chart. We're filling in the blanks as we go. We're going to get to the New Jerusalem, Paradise of God. We know it was here. We know it is here. And it, it, it will be here at the end, Revelation 22. How does it get from the Garden of Eden all the way to the New Jerusalem? So we're filling in these blanks. And the last blank we filled in was the standard for the brazen serpent. That's why I'm holding this in my hand. This was made by a friend of mine, and I just think that he did a great job. And again, on this standard in the wilderness, it had the ineffable name of God written on it, yud Hey vav Hey, according to rabbinical sources. We're talking about outside resources here. And it was supernaturally brought back to life by God when Aaron's uh, role as high priest was being challenged by the people. God said, put it before the Ark of the Covenant in the, in the Tent of Testimony. And when they went back in, when Moses went back in the next day, he found it to be alive, supernaturally brought back to life. It blossomed, put forth almond blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. So this was on the standard in the wilderness where the serpent in the wilderness eventually would be placed on this standard. So, here we are, standard for the brazen serpent, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 14, that the Lord Himself referenced this by saying, what you know about this, what you know happened here, and how when somebody looked at this, they were healed, as Moses lifted up this serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes will in Him, in the Lord, have the same gift that was given to those who ate from the fruit of the tree of life. They will be able to have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What we're referencing now is before the standard was put on here, when, uh, when it was placed before the Ark of the Covenant. Numbers chapter 17, verse 10. 
the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they should not die. So, what is before the Ark of the Covenant? What does that mean? According to Torah anthology, book of Yeshua, you can go to Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. It references this, Numbers chapter 35, verse 5. There is a 2,000 cubit radius around the Ark of the Covenant that is considered to be holy. Therefore, if the rod remained within that 2,000 cubit range, it was still considered before the Ark of the Covenant. And I want to remind you, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it tells us that the ineffable name of God was on this rod. Yud, He, Vav, He. Yahweh, Yehovah, if you want. Some people say Jehovah. So, we have placed before the Ark of the Covenant. This is the position that this would have been placed, and we're putting it into the flow chart. Now let's jump, jump over here to the Jewish Encyclopedia. This is very interesting because it says that this staff, and actually by the time it got to David, it would have looked like this because it would have had this serpent in the wilderness on it. David used this staff, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, according to rabbinical commentary now, it was in David's possession when he slew the giant Goliath. And it says, and we'll just tuck this away because we'll use this later, when the Messiah comes, it will be given to him for a scepter in token of his authority over the heathen. It is a symbol of the authority. Remember, the king, when Israel had kings, was entrusted with the preservation of this rod. It was the king's responsibility to make sure that the rod was preserved. Now, let's take a look and see the incident that that outside resource is referring to. And we're going to jump over here to 1 Samuel chapter 17. David is going to go against the giant Goliath. David is a, just a youth. So he goes to Saul and he petitions Saul and says, I can take this guy. And Saul says, are you sure? And David says, look, I took, a, I took on a lion, I took on a bear, this guy's nothing, I'll take him, okay? So Saul said, okay, I will let you be our champion and go against the giant Goliath. If that's what you want to do, I will endorse it. So the Bible says, David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I can't, I can't use these. I've not tested them. And David took them off. The key here is, who is his? Who is his? Obviously, his is not David's sword. His is not David's armor. It's Saul's armor, because David, or Saul is trying to help David. David says, it's not working for me. I can't go out like this. So, instead, he, David, took his stick in his hand. Now, in this case, the his, I'm referencing back here when he was given his sword, his armor, these are Saul's. I'm saying David took the Saul's stick. Why would he take the stick? This was entrusted with the preservation of the, the king was entrusted with the preservation of the rod. The king, if he's going to make David the champion of the armies of Israel to go against uh, the Philistines champion who is Goliath, David can't walk out there on his own because Saul could just say the guy was nuts. He went on, there on his own. He's a nobody. But if he goes with this, if he goes with the symbol of the authority of the king, then the nation of Israel knows, the armies of Israel knows, and the Philistines know that David is then set up as the champion for the armies of Israel, and he's going under the blessing of the king. So he's using this to make sure that everybody knows that Saul is in favor and giving David the blessing to go against Goliath uh, and, and fight against Goliath. And so, in verse 41, the Philistine came on and approached David with a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy, with a handsome appearance. And what he said to them was, the Philistine, he says, am I a dog that you come after me with stones and a slingshot? That's not what he said. What is he looking at? He's looking at this. 
He said, are you kidding me? You're going to take me on with sticks? You're, this is how you're going to fight me? And the Philistine also said to David, come to me. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And David then says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted, yud Hey bav Hey. I'm coming to you against the one that you're taunting here, the one that you're, you're making fun of, the stick has the name of God inscribed upon it, and I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And then he tells him exactly what he's going to do to him. He said, this day I'm going to deliver you up into my hands, God will. I'm going to strike you down, I'm going to take your head off of you, and I will give you the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky, the wild beasts of the earth, the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that there is a Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. And He did exactly what He said He was going to do. He takes the head of Goliath, He chops it off, the Philistine army flees away because they see his, their champion dead. The armies of Israel chased them, and exactly what David said was going to happen, happened. And I, I emphasize the head part because in verse 54, it says, David took the Philistine's head, Hebrew word rosh, and brings it to Jerusalem. Now, do you realize what this means? I mean, he's taking this skanky old head, and he's going all the way from the Valley of Elah, over rugged terrain, this is all hilly here, 16 miles and depositing it some t someplace here in Jerusalem. Head Rosh. Rosh in the Hebrew, like head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. That's what that term means. Okay, now let's go to 2 Samuel 15. David is now king. What did we say was the responsibility of the king? The king is entrusted with the preservation of the rod. David is fleeing from Absalom. Absalom has come. He's going to try to take David out, his own father, and remove him from the kingship. Absalom wants to be king. David realizes he's in trouble, and he, and he flees from his son Absalom. Verse 23 of 2 Samuel 15, when all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron. So we know where that was. All the people passed over toward the wilderness. Zadok feels compelled to carry the Ark of the Covenant of God and follow David out of the city. Now, why would he want to do that? Because, number one, it doesn't say it specifically in here, but I'm going to show you that there's credibility to this, so just stay with me. David must have been carrying this rod because if Zadok feels compelled to follow him with the ark, and the ark needs to be within a 2,000 rad cubit radius of the, of the rod, then if David is leaving with the, uh, the rod, Zadok feels like he needs to follow him with the, with the ark. I mean, that would be reasonable to assume. So then David says to, the, uh, to Zadok, Zadok, return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, he'll bring me back again, show me both it and his habitation. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here I am, let him do to me as seems good to him. David was a very humble person, a repentant person, and that's why David had a heart after the Lord. Because when he messed up, he knew enough that he repented. And he did so here too. He was in a very repentant state. He realized that what was happening was something that he brought upon himself. So 2 Samuel 15, 29, Zadok and Abathar did what the king asked him to do. He returns the ark of God to Jerusalem. And then in verse 30, David goes up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, he walked barefoot, and all the people were following him. So we know where he was going. He was going up on the top of the Mount of Olives. We know exactly because that's, I think this is the first place in the, in the Bible where the Mount of Olives is actually referred to as the Mount of Olives. So we go to 2 Samuel 15, 31. Somebody told David about Ahithophel. And then in verse 32, David was coming to the summit. Hebrew word there is rosh. Same word used for head. Now, whether or not it's Goliath's head, whether or not it's just the top of the Mount of Olives, 
It's uncertain. We don't know exactly, but the word there is rush, okay? So we know it's on the top where God was worshipped. This is the place where God was worshipped, and I want to show you the distance. David told uh, the high priest, Zadok, to bring the ark back to the city, which he did. <clears throat> David was going to the top, the Rosh of the Mount of Olives. And if you look at the distance from here to here is that parameter that we talked about, that distance of 2,000 cubits. It would have actually been here on the top of the Mount of Olives, which is where we, in a different program of Berean Endeavor, stated that the Lord gave His life. This is where He paid the price for our sins up on the top of the Mount of Olives. Remember, we, we said, we need to get this rod up on the top of the Mount of Olives because that's where the crucifixion took place, if indeed this could have been the tree. And what I'm suggesting now is that David took this rod supernaturally brought back to life by God Almighty, so it's alive, and he plants it there on top of the Mount of Olives, 2,000 cubits from the Ark of the Covenant to stay within those parameters. Now, is there anything in the Word of God that would give us credibility on that idea that I just presented? Watch this. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7. <clears throat> Solomon is king, and for as brilliant as this man was, he made the most foolish decision when he turned his back on God. And what he ended up doing is he's building high places of worship for Chemosh, the decessible idol of Moab on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem. So we know where these high places are built, on the mount which is east of Jerusalem. What's the mountain east of Jerusalem? Mount of Olives. And I know that there are other people that will say, well, that was a there were a couple of mountains south of that, and that's probably where it happened. When I see Mount of East of Jerusalem, that to me is Mount of Olives. Mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and from Moloch, the detestable light of the sons of Ammon. I mean, what was he thinking? So anyway, along comes King Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. And Hezekiah becomes king. He's only 25 years old, or he is 25 years old and becomes king. And he's a good king. And he sees, he does what's right in the sight of the Lord. He sees what's happening here. So he removes the high places. We know where they were because we read it in the, other, in the previous scripture. He removes the high places, which would have been on the Mount of Olives. He breaks, or he, he broke down the sacred pillars, cuts down the Asher. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. So this was never meant to be an object of worship, ever. Hezekiah knew that. He said, this is, this is ridiculous. We're going to remove this. We're going to break this. We're going to destroy this. This will remain. There's nothing in the Scripture that said that this was taken out also. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, up on the Mount of Olives, where those high places were, were where, the, where God was originally worshipped. Now, fast forward. Jeremiah. Jeremiah knew that the Babylonians were going to come and destroy the city. He needed a word from the Lord. He needed some reassurance that God had not taken His hand off the nation of Israel. God still had a purpose for them. He was going to bring them back. He was going to use them to to do what the Lord promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would be to give the world, the Messiah, that the seed of Abraham would be a blessing to all nations. And so he's looking for a, a word of comfort, a word of encouragement. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he said, what do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah could have said, I see the Kidron Valley. I see the city of David. I see the temple. I see the rod of an almond tree. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. What word would that be? It's up on the right place. It has the right calling. It's in the right setting. And so the word that the Lord is talking about is the word that He has placed upon this rod 
that when man would eat of the fruit, that he could live forever. How is he going to accomplish that? Through the tree of crucifixion. Rod of an almond tree, Jeremiah's almond rod, I should say, Mount of Olives, went from D Judges, Saul and David, went over here to Jeremiah's rod, and ultimately ends up being the tree of, cruci of crucifixion. Wow. So, I want to remind you, what's the calling? Genesis 3.22, take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. That was the calling of the original tree of life. Revelation 22 is going to end up in the gates of the city, the new Jerusalem, where there's eternal life. <sighs> what a picture. What a picture. And I want to show you also here this John 19.19. 19. And I'm going to use my other prop. I want to show you this sign that I had in the first of the three mini-series within this series. This would have been similar to what Pilate put together. And the Word of God tells us that Pilate wrote an inscription, put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Verse 20, many of them, the Jews, that read the inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. It was shown to be written in these three languages. Here are those three languages. Now, the only thing that we have left is the Greek, but this caused the high priest and the, and the priest to go crazy. Because what they said was, they ran back to, to Pilate, they said, wait a minute, wait, 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 you can't write it like that. Don't write the King of the Jews. S write that He said, I am King of the Jews. Write it any other way, but don't write it like this. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. If you go to a Roman Catholic crucifix and you see it, you will see on a Roman Catholic crucifix, I-N-R-I. Uh, um, I believe all of them have it anyway. And here's a close-up of it. Look what they're doing. They're using or they're borrowing an idea that the Hebrews had that when they will take the first letter of each word and put it together to see if it had a hidden meaning. Here's the Latin. Roman Catholic, they're going to key on the Latin and they're going to, they're going to put I-N-R-I. -I. It's a, an abbreviation of what was written by Pilate on the crucifixion uh, tree. The Hebrews, the priests are going to key on the Hebrew. They're going to see the Hebrew and they're going to key on what's written on the Hebrew. They're going to use the same idea, take the first letters, put it together to see if it had a hidden meaning. We're going to go from right to left. In this case, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, Yehovah, Yahweh, Holy Unspeakable Name of God. If you go into the transliteration of this, it says Yeshua, Hanatsri, Vemelech, King, Chayudim, of the Jews. Y H V H. Y-H-V-H, -H. that's the holy unspeakable name of God. Those priests went nuts. They said, you can't write it like that. You're telling everybody the man's God. Pilate, what I've written, I've written. I'm not changing it. I know what it says. In your face, this is what the man is. This is what I think. That's what I think anyway. That, he, that was the intent of what he did because he did not move off of that. And it's an incredible, incredible way to, to imprint in the people this man is who he said he was. He was the holy and righteous God. Even the centurion at the foot of the cross said, this man was the Son of God. I mean, what a day. And if we go to Revelation chapter 2, 12 and 19, it references that when the Lord comes back, He's going to rule with a rod of iron. The word iron there is symbolic of authority. And if you go into the Midrash, this is rabbinical commentary now. It even talks about the Messiah coming. It will be given to him as a sign for a scepter in token of his authority over the heathen. Elijah will be the one to give the rod to Messiah when he comes. This is, again, Encyclopedia of Jewish, uh, Judaica. And the word iron references Psalm 2 verse 9 as a symbol or a sig to signify absolute authority. So when he comes back, 
He's going to rule with a rod that is the authority that shows that he has the authority to do so, just like the kings used it to show that they had the authority to be king. So, we're completing the flow chart here. And he's going to be even using this as in the second coming, according to what this, the rabbis say, according to what is stated in the Word, and it's going to go all the way through the, from the Garden of Eden all the way to the New Jerusalem. And right here is the apex, the tree of the crucifixion, giving us the apparatus upon which he hung in order to give us eternal life. So, in summary, just think about this now. The Son of God came to the city of God to give his life for the kingdom of God, on the rod of God, which was located in the place where God was worshipped, with the name of God inscribed upon it, so that whosoever believes in him should become, could become children of God. This was the plan of God for mankind's redemption. It's magnificent. You think God had anything to do with this plan? It's all through it. So, I, I, just, I just think it's incredible. And look, I was just as saved when I believed that the Lord gave His life on a Roman cross. We don't have to know this. God made this so simple. Thank God He did. We don't have to know this, but I do believe that this gives incredible glory to God because we can see the sovereign hand of God all through this. It started from the Garden of Eden and it never changed. No demon in hell could change it. And God had a calling on a tree, a tree called the tree of life, that when man ate from the fruit, that man would have the opportunity to live forever. And God uses this tree upon which His Son would give His life so that when we believed in the Lord and what He did for us in giving His life as payment for our sins, we can have eternal life through Him. It's just incredible. This is who we serve. I hope and pray again that this was a blessing to you. I want to leave you with this positive word that I always do. It's Numbers chapter 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you His peace. God bless you. I hope it was a blessing to you. We'll see you next time right here on Berean Endeavor. Thank you so much. Music